Good morning, sir. Good morning. Can I call Miss Cumberland, please? Yes, of course. Thank you. Would you like to repeat after me? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Can you state your full name, please? Davlin Cumberland. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cumberland. You should have in front of you a witness statement um, with the URN WITN 09130100. Um, do you have that in front of you? Yes. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to look at page 12 of that witness statement? You should see there a signature. Can you confirm that signature is Yes, yeah, it is my signature. Thank you. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That witness statement will go into evidence and it will be published on the inquiry's website shortly. Um, I'd like to begin briefly by your background. You started working for the post office in 1990 as a counter clerk, is that right? Correct. Um, and I think you've worked in various different positions until 1999 when you became a Horizon Field Support Officer. Yes. Right? Um, can you, we, we've heard about it in previous phases, but can you briefly remind us what a Horizon Field Support Officer was? Um, it was the program where, uh, the Horizon Implementation Program, where post office branch accounts were migrated from manu the old manual accounting system onto the Horizon system. Um, so they were going electronic and I worked on the field support team where we would, the, the, the accounts would be migrated onto the electronic system. We would then stay on site with the supposed, the supposed master or the branch manager um, maybe for, I think it might have been three or four days and we would come to support them and we would complete the first weekly balance with them. Thank you very much. In 2001, you joined a program called the Retail Line Review Trial. Uh, can you tell us briefly what that was, um, and in particular how you became involved in something called the Suspense Account Team? Well, from what I remember, the Retail Line Review Trial was where they centralised all the regional helplines to the Network Business Support Centre that was then based in Barnsley. Um, the, they had, they separated the network of post office branches into commercial branches and rural branches. The rural branches were supported by an area manager and the commercial branches were, I think they were called retail line managers if I remember rightly. Um, the suspense account team uh, was evolved from this restructure of centralising, centralising, managing, I suppose you would call it managing losses and gains. Ra Previously, it had been managed locally by the area offices and they were centralising that to the Network Business Support Centre. So the suspense account team was basically to uh, manage the losses and gains that were held in branch suspense accounts. And I think you worked in that position from 2001 until 2004? Yes, from what I remember, yes. And then you subsequently held a number of different roles in the post office. Uh, and you continue to work in the post office yes. now. Um, I think you're uh, involved in on-site training, or the, uh, part of the on-site training team now, is that correct? Yes. And that's nothing to do with Horizon, or, or does it involve Horizon? The, the, the team I work on now? Yeah. Yes, oh yes, we, we, I do deliver on-site training to newly appointed postmasters and their staff. Um, so we would be training them on the Horizon system. So in fact, from the rollout of Horizon to the present day, you've had various roles often involving use of the Horizon system. Correct, yeah. Um, I don't think your background's in computing, though. No, it? no. no. Uh, and how would you describe your knowledge of computing uh, when it comes to, for example, the identification of bugs, errors, or defects <laughs> in the system? Um, 
I'm, I'm not no expert with computing. I'm not, in fact, I'm, you know, I'm not good with technology at all. Uh, so I, 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 I don't know any, anything about bugs or anything like that. And presumably back in the early 2000s, you were perhaps even less knowledgeable about computers than you are now. Yes. I want to ask you about suspense accounts mm -hmm. and what they involve. We, we've heard about suspense accounts in previous phases. Um, they were a facility to temporarily transfer apparent shortfalls into a separate account. Um, I'd like to take you through a couple of those policies that related to the suspense mm -hmm. account. But is that a, that's a fair description of the suspense account? Yes, the suspense account is where uh, either losses or gains would be held awaiting to be cleared. Can we look at poll 00075026, please? Thank you very much. This is a policy from 2003, so approximate to the period that we're going to be discussing today. Um, accounting losses policy for agency branches. Can we look at page four, please? Is this policy familiar to you? Should I be able to see it? Uh, yes, you should. Sorry, is it not on, coming up on the screen in front no. of you? Ah, we may have to take a very short break. Uh, can, can you tell us what is on the screen in front of you? Uh, nothing, it's just blank. Okay. Um, so perhaps we could take a very short five-minute break to resolve that issue. Yes, of course. Um, just for you to know, it is on my screen, all right? Thank you very much. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Do you want me to come back on screen? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, the solution, it seems, was uh, pressing the on button. Right. OK, fine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that you should have in front of you is, sorry, if we could turn back to the first page. Thank you. So this is the accounting losses policy for agency branches. Is, is that a policy that's familiar to you? Yes. Thank you. Um, could we turn to page four, please? Uh, and I'll just r read and highlight um, the second and third paragraph of this policy. It says, under certain exceptional circumstances, losses can be held in the suspense account for a maximum of eight weeks. These circumstances require the agent to justify the reasons for not making the loss good immediately. Uh, just pausing there, agent it is effectively sub-postmaster, isn't it? Yes. Um, before any authority to move a specific loss to the suspense account is given, therefore, the agent must have completed their own investigation and be able to show that an error notice is likely to be issued for, for that loss or an element of that loss. Authority to hold an accounting discrepancy must be sought via the National Suspense Account Team at the Network Business Support Centre. Is that the team that you were working in? Yes. Um, the loss needs to be identified against a known error that has been made and the likelihood that an error notice will be issued. Uh, if there is no known error and therefore no error notice likely to be issued, authority will not be given. Um, so authority won't be given if there is a, um, uh, unless there's a known error. That can come down, thank you. Um, can you assist us with what you understood a known error to be? Uh, an accounting error where perhaps they had um, done a miskey with the transaction 
you know, if they'd put through maybe £150 instead of £15 for a bill payment, it could be where they'd put a deposit through as a withdrawal uh, for Gyro Bank or a withdrawal through the deposit or National Savings Bank. They could maybe have put settled cheques to cash or settled cash to cheque and sent their cheques off incorrectly. So it would have been a known error in their accounts. And in fact, in your witness statement, I think you describe it as a known accounting error. Um, yes. And is that to distinguish it, for example, from a software error? Yes, not, not a software error, an actual mistake where they had put and actually entered something incorrectly on the system. Um, to your knowledge, did, for example, Fujitsu play any part in defining what was a known error? N not to my knowledge. I wouldn't have known that, no. no. In terms of software errors, then, it seems as though that's not, in fact, on, on your evidence, covered in, in that policy. No. Um, were there briefings in your team as to software errors when they were discovered? No. To your knowledge, did those who carried out the job of examining whether there were said to be accounting errors um, at that stage have access to Fujitsu's audit records, what we know as, for example, ARQ reports or Fujitsu's raw audit data? Not to my knowledge. And it seems from the policy that the burden was on the sub-postmaster to identify the error, the agent to identify the error. Yes. I mean, it, it said in that policy that the agent must have completed their own investigation. Um, typically, what did that involve? Well, we would ask them to check. Or back then, if I remember rightly, there would have been a lot of a lot of the accounts was still paper based, so there would have been a docket for every transaction. For example, if there was a, a, a banking deposit into Gyro Bank, there would be a docket, or a Gyro withdrawal, there would be a docket. So we would ask them to check all their dockets against what they had entered onto the system. So uh, we would ask them to make sure, double check their cash, check that they had remitted cash incorrectly, check that if they'd sent any cash back to the cash centre, that they'd check the they'd sent it back correctly, that it matched the, the figures they had on the docket that they'd sent back matched what they'd put onto Horizon. So it was really checking everything that they had in paper form matched what they'd put onto their uh, Horizon system. I'm going to look at another policy, and that can be found at poll 00088867. A similar policy. This is the liability for losses policy. Again, it's a 2003 policy. Is this a policy that's familiar to you? I think so. Perhaps if we turn to page five, that may assist. Um, this addresses authority to hold losses. And uh, I'll, I'll just like the policy before, I'll read the second and third paragraph there. Um, under, the circum under circumstances where the exact cause of the loss is known and a compensating error is expected to be returned, losses may be held in the suspense account with authority, providing that the agent has completed their own investigation, that's the investigation I think you've just been referring to, uh, and is able to show that an error notice is likely to be issued for that loss or an element of that loss i.e. the agent must be able to detail a specific error that occurred for a specific client on a specific date and be able to provide documentary evidence, e.g. from the Horizon transaction log. Uh, before moving a specific accounting discrepancy to the suspense account, authority must be sought from the agent's debt team three via the NBSC. If there's no clearly defined evidence of a known error, and therefore no error notice likely to be issued, authority will not be given. Um, can you recall as any situation where an agent provided evidence of a known error when it comes to a, a software error? No. Um, uh, realistically, was that because uh, 
a sub-postmaster couldn't be expected themselves to identify uh, what is a complex uh, software matter. Uh, I don't know because software errors weren't anything that we were in, involved with at all on our, on, on our team. It, it, software errors didn't even, it was never even discussed. Um, so, so if a sub-postmaster was saying, I have money that is held in the suspense account, um, that's because of a software error. I consider that to be uh, an error that, is, that meets the, the test for uh, authorization under this policy. What, what would happen? Well, that never happened. I never had that conversation with a sub-postmaster. Um, can we look, please at poll 00081490 underscore 046. Thank you very much. Um, this is the witness statement of Elizabeth Morgan in the Lee Castleton case. We'll come on to Lee Castleton's case shortly. Um, can you briefly tell us who, who was Elizabeth Morgan? She was a work colleague on the, on the suspense account team. Um, so if we scroll down on that page, um, she describes the policy as, as follows. It's paragraph four, the last sentence, and the bullet points below. The sub-postmaster might be given permission to transfer the shortfall from the cash account to the suspense account, where it could legitimately remain for up to eight weeks, provided either, A, they provided a sufficiently detailed and ex acceptable explanation for the discrepancy, B, they submitted a hardship form which showed that they could not afford to make good the shortfall in the cash account, or, and then we have C, exceptionally their retail line manager authorised it. Um, is that a fair explanation of, of the policy so far as you understood it? Yes. Um, when it came to a bug, error or defect in Horizon, it seems from A, B and C then, and the explanation you've just given, that that simply wouldn't have been covered? No. Um, thank you, that can come down. Um, we know that uh, from the High Court proceedings that during the time that you were involved in the Castleton case, and the Castleton case was, was um, in those early stages of where, where you were involved, um, there are a number of bugs, errors, and defects in Horizon. Um, calendar square bug, reversals bug, data tree build, failure discrepancies, gyrobank discrepancies, counter replacement issues, phantom transactions, reconciliation issues, concurrent logins, transaction correction issues, bugs, errors, defects introduced by previously applied peak fixes. Were those known in your team, um, or the, the people who were dealing with the Spence account, were those kinds of issues known within that team? No. And in fact, I think at paragraph 45 of your witness statement, we don't need to uh, bring that onto screen. I think you've said that you simply weren't aware of any bugs, errors, or defects no. in Horizon. Um, looking back, where a sub-postmaster experienced what they considered to be an unexplained loss, do you think that there was sufficient investigation, particularly at that technical level, uh, to fully understand the cause of that loss? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, absolutely. Um, looking, looking back, um, where there was a sub-postmaster who experienced what they considered to be an unexplained loss, uh, and perhaps they considered it to be a software issue. Uh, was there, so far as you could tell, sufficient investigation uh, on a technical level to fully understand the cause of that loss? Well, I never had any conversation with a supposed master where it was ever suggested that there was a technical fault. So that scenario didn't arise because it was never suggested that there was a technical fault so it didn't even never occur to me if we put to one side the lee castleton case looking back do you consider that the policies that we've just been looking at place too much of an evidential burden on the sub postmaster particularly knowing now that there were indeed software issues quite possibly yeah 
I want to ask you about your involvement in the Lee Castleton case. Can you remember the first involvement that you had with Lee Castleton's accounts and how you became involved? I have no recollection at all of being involved with the Lee Castleton case. I have got, I don't remember any of it. Um, perhaps I can take you to some documents and that might help refresh your memory. You, you have set out in your witness statement some recollection based on these documents. Can we look at poll 00070758, please? Uh, this is a decision paper that was written by uh, Ms. Oglesby. Uh, can, can you assist us with who she was? Uh, I think Kath Oglesby at the time was the retail line manager. And what was your relationship with her? I don't recall having any relationship with Kath Oglesby. Um, I only know from reading the documents that have been provided to me that she was the retail line manager at the time. I'll just read a few paragraphs from this decision paper. Um, this is following an interview with Lee Castleton on the 10th of May 2004. She says, my thoughts after the interview with Lee are that he could not provide any evidence of a computer problem. <clears throat> Next paragraph, she says, um, final sentence, he and his assistant, Chrissy have said they spent hours checking transaction logs but found nothing to back up the claims of computer error. Uh, pausing there, would you expect a computer error to be shown uh, just by looking at transaction logs? Do you think that would be sufficient to identify a computer error? Well, I don't know anything about computer errors, but I, if I was to hazard a guess, I'd say no. Um, it says, Lee would not even listen to the suggestion that a member of his staff may be taking the money. In my opinion, if you know yourself that you haven't taken anything, it must be someone else. Uh, so you'll be open to the suggestions and not discount anything. Lee has always maintained that it must be a software problem. Um, if we scroll down a little bit further, um, that, that final paragraph on the screen at the moment, Lee has asked for a lot of information, some of which cannot be provided. I have endeavoured to help him and provide as much information as possible. There has been nothing to suggest any problem with the computer system. Uh, and next paragraph, and, and this, insofar as you're involved, in, was concerned it is a, the significant paragraph. She says, Lee asked me to explain the discrepancies at the top of the final balance. I've asked for assistance from colleagues for this. Copies have been sent to Liz Morgan and Davlin Cumberland. Uh, they have helped me explain the figures on his balance. They do not feel anything was wrong with Horizon. Um, now, can you tell us, who, who was Liz Morgan? Liz was a colleague who I worked with on the suspense account team. Um, the statement there, they do not feel anything was wrong with Horizon, we see, and I'll take you in due course to the various documentation, we see that I think you corrected that in due course, um, that that, in fact, wasn't your position. Is that right? I don't have any recollection of this at all. Sorry, I, I don't remember this. If we go over the page, um, she says there that, to summarize, uh, terminate Lee Castleton's contract for services due to large unexplained losses at his office. There's no evidence to support his theory of software problems. Can we please look at poll 00071073? Um, this is an email from Stephen Dilley. He was a solicitor at Bon Pierce. Uh, and you can see there that yourself and Liz Morgan are included in that. I mean, you, you have refreshed your memory from these documents before coming to the hearing today, haven't you? Yes. Yes. Uh, and does this jog your memory about the fact that you were involved uh, with a uh, legal case relating to Lee Castleton? No, it doesn't. I don't have any recollection of it at all. Um, if we look at this document, he says that he acts on behalf of the post office. He summarizes uh, the case. He says, Mr. Castleton's defense is that the apparent shortfalls are nothing more than accounting errors arising from the operation of the Horizon computer system. 
Mr. Castleton was suspended on the 24th of March 2004. On the 10th of May 2004, Kath Oglesby, then the retail line manager, interviewed Mr. Castleton. After the interview, she sent copies of the cash and suspense accounts to you, and you confirmed to her that you could not see anything wrong with the way that the computers were working. Do you think you would have been in a position to have said one way or another whether there was something wrong with the way that the computers were working? No. Um, so although you may not recall this particular incident, um, reading that, does that sound like something that you would have said to Kath Oglesby? If somebody had asked me to look at the branch accounts, uh, the cash account as it was then, to have a look over it to see if I could see if there were anything that stood out to say that there had been an error, I would probably have said, if, if, I would probably look at it and if I could see something I would say and if there wasn't, I would say I can't find anything. But that doesn't indicate anything to do with a software problem. And perhaps we can look at poll 00072707. This is a telephone attendance note that appears to have been um, written by or on behalf of Stephen Dilley, uh, dated the 2nd of October 2006. And he says there, I had a telephone conversation with Davlin Cumberland. She was returning a call I had left on her telephone voicemail in relation to what, uh, what was meant and it was said that they were unable to find anything that was wrong. She meant the word unusual, and I have already amended the witness statement to reflect this. Saying that, I had emailed it to her and asking her to review it if she's happy with, uh, to approve it by printing two copies, etc. cetera. Um, so it seems there that he, he asked you what you meant by the word wrong, uh, and that in fact you meant the word unusual. D does this assist you at all? No, I still can't remember. It, it may assist if I take you to your witness statement from those proceedings. It is LCAS 40566. This is your statement that was provided in the Lee Castleton case. Um, can we look at paragraph three, please? This may assist with, with the role that you undertook in relation to Lee Castleton's accounts. And perhaps I'll, I'll read that paragraph and I'll take you through it stage by stage. It says, in or around May 2004, so two and a half years before this statement was actually written, um, I was asked by my colleague Elizabeth Morgan to examine various cash accounts she had received from Catherine Oglesby who at the time, I am informed, was Mr. Castleton's retail, I think that's retail line manager, uh, for 14 South Marine Drive, etc. Given that two and a half years have passed since I examined them, I cannot now remember what exactly it was in the cash accounts or which weeks that I looked at. However, at the time, I was used to carrying out the exercise for retail line managers, uh, so I believe that I would have reviewed the figures in the stock receipts and payments in the cash accounts and looked for anything unusual, such as whether particular figures varied significantly from week to week or whether they were unusual for the type of transaction concerned. Uh, just pausing there, you, you say, however, at the time I was used to carrying out the exercise. Um, I think you said in your witness statement that it wasn't officially part of your role. No, it wasn't. C can you assist us with uh, why you would have uh, been used to carrying out that task? and what it may have involved? Well, in fact, it wasn't something that happened often. It was quite rare on a few, maybe a handful of occasions where we may have been asked to look at some branch accounts from somebody from the retail line. It wasn't often. Um, And I do have a vague recollection of Liz asking me to assist her to look at some branch accounts that had been sent to her, but I honestly couldn't say 
which 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 post office it was for or which the postmaster was I, I do have a recollection of her asking me to help her look at some branch accounts so although it says there i was used to carrying out this exercise in fact it it, it was rare it was rare and it, yeah it was rare and it was more done as a favor you know would you mind casting your, your eye over this to have a look um it wasn't an official part of our role. Um, can you assist us? The words I was used to carrying out, might that be the, the words of the solicitor rather than yourself? Or do you think well, I don't wording? have any recollection of... Uh, to be honest, when I saw this, I was shocked because I had no recollection of it at all. And, I mean, clearly, I must have done it because it's there in, in, in its legal. So I must have done it, but I don't remember doing it. Can you assist us with the actual task, reviewing figures of stock receipts and payments in the cash accounts? W would that have been reviewing the Horizon printout? Yes. Um, the hard copy printout. Yes. So, so everything you would have been looking at would have been generated by Horizon? Yes. And if we read on, it says, I do remember that we were unable to find anything unusual or anything to suggest that the losses were not real losses. Now, the word unusual there, we've seen from that conversation with Mr. Dilley, that it seems as though you may have corrected the word wrong to the word unusual. Does that assist you at all? I mean, th this form of words, does that sound like, sound like you? No. The words, anything to suggest that the losses were not real losses, is, is that a phrase that you understand? I understand it, but I don't remember writing it or saying it. But, yeah, I understand it. Do you think you were in a position definitively to say uh, whether alleged discrepancies were genuine losses for the no. post office? Perhaps if we look at the statement of Elizabeth Morgan... I took you to an unsigned version of that statement, and perhaps we'll, we'll look at that again. That was poll 00081490. Thank you. And if we can look at the second page of that statement. Um, at paragraph 9, the unsigned version of that statement says and in the final sentence, I do remember asking my colleague Davlin Cumberland to assist and that we are unable to find anything wrong. I reported this to Catherine Oglesby. Uh, so, so that's the unsigned version. And now I'll take you to the signed version of Miss Morgan's statement. That is poll 00074062. And if we look over the page, please, paragraph 9. Um, she says there about halfway down... Um, However, given at the, um, that at the time I was used to carrying out this exercise for RLMs, I believe that I would have reviewed the figures in the stock receipts and payments in the cash accounts... I would have looked for anything unusual, such as whether particular figures varied significantly from week to week in the cash accounts or whether they were unusual for the type of transaction concerned. I do remember asking my colleague, Davlin Cumberland, to assist and that we were unable to find anything out of the ordinary or anything that suggested that the losses were not real losses. I reported this to Catherine Oglesby. Uh, does this assist you at all in... in um, you'll see there, for example, that the... Word, the original wording uh, has been changed to now it reads anything out of the ordinary yeah. uh, and it includes the words anything that suggested that the losses were not real losses. Does that assist you with identifying where that phrase came from at all? I mean, Do you think the wording was yours, the solicitors, Miss Morgan's or somebody I else's? I don't, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. But it's not a phrase that you think you would have used? No. Can we now look at 
LCAS 40609, please. If we go over the page, this is the statement of Catherine Oglesby. If we look at the final page, or penultimate page even, sorry, page 14, Um, if we scroll down, we can see that this is the signed statement from the 21st of January 2006. So that's before the conversation that appears to have been recorded between yourself and Mr. Dilly. Could we please look at page 13, paragraphs 42 and 43? So at 42, she says... I explained to Mr. Castleton that the Horizon system is a double entry accounting system and that everything I had checked worked through. The evidence does not support Mr. Castleton's theory that the Horizon system went wrong when he entered the stock remittances onto the system. Uh, Post interview 43. After the interview, I sent copies of the cash and suspense accounts to Elizabeth Morgan and Davlin Cumberland in Leeds, who were the two people very experienced in dealing with the suspense accounts. Neither of them could see anything wrong with the way that the computers were working. Uh, As I say, that was signed before your conversation with Mr. Dilley. Um, But in light of that subsequent conversation uh, and your evidence today, is it right to say that that, in fact, was not an accurate statement? In so far as you didn't see anything wrong with the way that the computers were working. Do you think that accurately reflects the position at the time? You mean... So this is Miss Oglesby's statement from January 2006. And it says there, it refers to you and Ms. Morgan, and it says neither of you could see anything wrong with the way that the computers were working. Um, Considering the evidence you've given, and also the email, the the note from uh, Mr. Dilley, for example, is that an accurate statement in fact? No, probably not. You say probably not. Why probably? Well, because we wouldn't know if there was a problem with the computers. We wouldn't have known that. If you were, uh, were you aware, I mean, it may be that you can't, simply can't remember this, but were you aware um, of that phrase having been included in a witness statement? That, no. Do you think you would remember uh, an event like that? Or is it simply passage of time and you can't remember? I, I think it's just so long ago uh, I can't, I have no recollection of it whatsoever. I want to now ask you about your response to, or the response to various issues with Horizon. Can we look at your witness statement, please? That's WITN 09130100, page 11. It's paragraph 46. Um, So, at 45, you talk about bugs, errors, and defects, uh, and you say that you weren't aware of any in the Horizon system. 46, I think you say that you did become aware of some sub-postmasters taking legal action. Um, And then you say this. You say, I recall that senior management at the time provided us with a standard response, although although I don't recall the specific wording, uh, to any questions raised by branch staff while we were... um, outperforming our daily roles. Um, Can you assist us with, uh, you may not be able to recall the specific wording, but can you recall what that standard response was? Yeah, I have got this email somewhere on my laptop, and I've searched for it, but I've just not been able to find it. Um, It was a a response uh, that, that, that... was it was more of a, a, a do's and don'ts in what we should and shouldn't be saying, um, the terminology that we should use while we are out on site, 
because we work out in the field on site with some postmasters and their staff. And it was, it was if we should ask, be asked any questions or it was who to refer them to, which was mainly um, the Network Business Support Centre, which is now the Branch Support Centre. It was more about what, what, what we should never say, what we could and couldn't say. It was more about that, really. It, it, it was a guide. It was to guide us um, through what, what potentially could have been quite a difficult time for us being out on site all the time. Um, but strangely, it, 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 I was never required to use it. So that's probably why I put it to the back of my mind. Um, can you recall who may have sent it to you? No. Uh, no. An approximate time period? Oh, it would have been um, probably around about 2019, um, I think. As late as 2019, because it, we say there that um, you started working for the post office again at 2012. I think you took a, a short break. But, but you, your thoughts are that it was t as late as 2019? It could have been. It, it could have been, or it could have been before. I can't exactly remember. I did try and look for it because I know I wouldn't have deleted it. Um, and I just couldn't find it. Can you recall any headline points from that as to what you shouldn't be saying to sub postmasters? Uh, it was not, you know, if, if, if anybody was to ask... Uh, uh, about the problems with the Horizon system, we were to refer them to uh, the Branch Support Centre. We weren't to really get engage in any kind of uh, conversation about it. Um, and it was th 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 sometimes the, it was how we spoke to some postmasters uh, to treat them respectfully and talk to them respectfully, which I've always done anyway. So, it was kind of a guide, really. I can't think of anything specific. Thank you very much. We can ask the post office for um, a copy of that if they, if they hold it. Um, thank you very much, Ms Cumberland. I don't have any further questions. Uh, there may be questions from core participants. Uh, and, sir, do you have any questions at all? No. No, well, I don't think I need... Um, yes, I just asked a question. Um, Ms. Cumberland, you, you made a witness statement in the Lee Castleton case, and you've given me your evidence about that. My impression is that you didn't actually give evidence of this trial. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah. I think if I had have given the evidence at, at, at the trial, I think I would have remembered it. Um, I think that is something that I would have definitely remembered. Well, uh, that, that's the impression I formed, but I just wanted to be clear about it. Thank you. Yes, I have no further questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ms. Page ha has. Ms. Cumberland. Yes, Page. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Cumberland, I act for a number of the sub postmasters, including Mr. Castleton. Uh, did you sign witness statements often in your roles, any of your roles? No. Uh, so your complete lack of memory of what was a rare event. Looking back, uh, do you think it can have been made clear to you that this was an important document? Sorry, could you say that again? Well, a witness statement for the High Court is an important document, and you've explained to us that this was a rare event, perhaps even a one-off. Yeah. Do you think it can have been made clear to you how important this was, given that you don't remember it at all? Yeah, I, 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 I can't remember. I, I, I don't know. I, I would say it should have probably been made clear to me how important it was, but I, I don't remember it, so I can't... I don't know how to answer that, really. You now feel that some of the phrases within it were not your own... Um, and things that you uh, wouldn't have said. Can you give us any idea how you think that could have come about? I don't know. No. All right. Well, can I then ask you just a, a couple of things that are more about um, what you would have and could have done? Um, 
you've explained that you didn't have access to anything other than the Horizon printouts. Correct. And all you'd have been able to spot is uh, perhaps something like a large mistake in processing a cheque or a cash uh, transaction. Correct. If um, Horizon had failed to record a payment out that had in fact been paid, <coughs> and the Horizon figure for cash on hand would therefore be higher, wouldn't it? Yeah than it, in fact the actual quantity of cash yeah. in the branch. That's not something your check would have been able to no. spot? No, no. Uh, and, and similarly, if on receipt of a check, Horizon had failed to register the check and had perhaps recorded it as cash in error, the system would say that there was more cash in the branch than in fact there was, wouldn't it? Yes. And indeed, at the end of the day, branch staff needed to reconcile physical checks with the Horizon list. Is that right? Yes. Um, and if the check had not registered as a check, it wouldn't be on that list, would it? No. So uh, the branch staff may have seen that the check was not there and entered it again. Is that fair to say? Yes, that's fair to say. And under those circumstances, the... Uh, sum of money would have registered both as cash from the mistake earlier on, the Horizon mistake earlier on, and as a cheque when the branch staff were then going through the cheques list, sees it, they see it's not there and they enter it as a cheque. Yes. So you can see how in yes. those circumstances Horizon may have recorded that sum of money twice. Yes. And again, that's not something your cheque would have been able to identify. No, no, not, not by us just looking at the branch uh, cash account, no. Um, was anyone from your team part of the decision or feeding into the decision to remove local suspense accounts? No, no. not to my knowledge. Um, presumably, once that was a facility that was removed, your team was disbanded, was it? Yes. Uh, our team was disbanded, and I believe they moved. it, it was moved to Chesterfield, and it, it's what became known as the agent debt team in Chesterfield. And so it was a rather different operation because it was no longer about suspense accounts. It was about I, following up debt. I, I think so. I, I, it wasn't part of that. I actually moved on to a different team before the suspense account was disbanded, so I, I can't say. You're not entirely yeah. sure. All right. Well, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Page. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Cumberland, for giving your witness statement and for coming to give evidence to the inquiry. I'm grateful to you. Thank you, sir. Um, for logistical reasons, could we take a break until 11.30, please, before the next witness? There'll be plenty of time for the next witness. Yeah, of course. So 11.30, uh, we'll resume the hearing. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you. May we please call Mr. Wise? Yeah. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Could you confirm your full name, please, Mr. Wise? Andrew Wise. And you should have in front of you a hard copy of a witness statement in your name, dated the 31st of May, 2023. Have you got that there? Yes. Um, if you turn to the last page of that, please, that is page 31. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? Yes, I do. And is that your signature? Yes, it is. And are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. For the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 
090-901-00. There's no need to display that now. Thank you for coming to assist the inquiry with its work and for providing the witness statement you have. We are very grateful. As you know, I will be asking questions on behalf of the inquiry, um, and today I'm going to be asking you about issues which arise in phase four of the inquiry, focusing on your involvement in the proceedings brought by the post office against Mr Castleton, relating to the alleged losses at Marine Drive Post Office Branch. You joined the post office in 1991 as a counter clerk in a directly managed branch, also known as a crown office branch, is that right? Yes, that's right. And you were in that role for eight years? Yes. You joined the Horizon Project in 1999 as a Horizon Field Support Officer, is that right? Yes. And that role involved you migrating post office branches from a manual accounting system onto the Horizon system? Yes. You say at paragraph three of your statement that following a branch migration, you would spend the next two days in branch providing support to the sub-postmaster and their staff, and that involved providing balance support to the branch on their first balance day. Is that right? That's right, yes. And in 2001, you joined the Network Business Support Centre as a service support advisor working on Tier 2, is that right? Yes. A role you held until 2004? Yes. And that role involved providing support to post office branches and their staff when contacting the MBSC with a variety of problems, including problems balancing using the Horizon system, didn't it? Yes, that's right. And then from 2004 to 2007, you worked in the training delivery team where you were a training manager, providing classroom training to new sub-postmasters and their staff. Yes. And was that training on the Horizon system? It was, yes. And in 2007, you moved to the sales team? Yes. Uh, you were a transitional manager with no specific designated role between 2008 and 2010? Yes. And during that time in 2010, you worked on the Horizon Online project. Um, can you please clarify what that role involved? I was in charge of a team of schedulers that would schedule the poll resource that attended branches on the day of the migration. Um, so around 300 branches a day would be migrated onto Horizon Online and we had a pool of hundreds of people that, that would carry out the roles to support branches. So we would match up the, the people with the branches based on geography um, and make sure that every branch being migrated onto Horizon Online had the support and that support involved them turning up in the afternoon when the post office closed, that's when the branch would be migrated over onto a Horizon Online, and then they would turn up the next morning um, and provide a morning's worth of support, and then move on to the, the next branch that they would support in the afternoon. So, so the job of the schedulers were to make sure that the poll resource was in that branch to assist and, and migrate the branch over. So is it right to say that was really about the logistics of providing the support? My role was, yes. And in 2011, you joined the security team as a security manager, is that right? Yes. And you held that role until you moved into the security intelligence team in 2015 as a security intelligent analyst. Yes, that's right. Are you still in that role with the I am, office? yes. When you joined the Horizon Project in 1999, what were you told about the history and the development of Horizon? I don't think I was told a great deal. Um, I had followed a little bit of, of the design of it, and my understanding was, and I'm not sure where this understanding came from, that the Horizon system was designed around the DWP work for pension books, um, 
and, and that's why it had such security on it, firewalls and the protection. That was the standard that the DWP wanted. So the system was designed specifically for pensions and allowances. And the DWP at some point um, changed their mind and, and wanted to move to an online banking where, where pensions were paid into bank accounts. Um, so my understanding was we were left with a system that was built for one specific reason, but then had to be kept and used because they were so far down the line with that system. Um, I don't really know a great deal more about the history than that. Were you aware of any problems during the rollout of Horizon? Not specifically with the actual serving and using the Horizon system. I think there was a lot of challenges in the logistics of setting the system up in branches. So as an HSFO, we would turn up at four o'clock in the afternoon, the postmaster would balance, and then we would migrate all the figures from that balance onto the Horizon system. Quite often, um, your work would be what we called aborted. You'd get a phone call to say, you're not going to that migration because they've not been able to put the kit in or there's been a problem putting the kit in the branch, so that would fall off your schedule. They'd look for other work for you to do, or you might just then <laughs> have to wait for your next branch that was migrated. But I wasn't aware of any problems using the system, um, and I didn't experience any problems personally, um, but it, there was a lot of migrations cancelled and aborted because of the issues put in the actual system. In, in the post office branch. I'm not aware what those issues were. We just get told you don't need to attend this branch because they've not got the, the computer system set up. And in your role on the Horizon project from 1999 to 2001, did you have regular contact with anyone from Fujitsu? I remember there was a team from, well, it was ICL Pathway then. Um, it wasn't Fujitsu, but there was a team from ICL Pathway that would go out and monitor you doing the migration. Um, little was understood for why they was there. They'd just stand there and watch you. We didn't really interact. They didn't provide support to us, um, but they was just there F from a a support point of view, we may contact the Horizon System help desk, um, mainly if a printer wasn't working, if the computer needed rebooting, if there were a screen freeze. Um, so we, we may contact the Horizon System help desk frequently, but that wasn't a direct link as an HFSO. That was as a branch location, contacting them to report an issue. And what training were you given on the Horizon System? <laughs> before you went out to branches to provide support in relation to migration to the system? We, I'm not 100% sure. I think it, it's two weeks. It could have been three weeks, but I'm thinking about it more. I think it was two weeks. We were actually on a, we'll call it a in-house course in Doncaster. So we were two weeks in a hotel. Within that hotel, um, we had the training on Horizon. So we received the equivalent training to what postmasters would receive, and then we received additional training on how to actually migrate the branch. So probably a week of that two-week course was around the actual physically migrating the branch and, and how to do that. And given the experience you gained in your role as a Horizon Field Support Officer, would it be accurate to say that you brought a good understanding of the balancing procedures which sub-postmaster and branch staff were required to follow when you moved then to the Network Business Support Centre? I would say I had a very good understanding. Um, when I moved onto the Horizon project, I had a good understanding of, of the balancing process. I'd worked in a Crown office for eight years. Part of that was manually balancing and then part of that was on the system called Echo Plus and Horizon was relatively similar to 
the, the, the physical process was similar to Echo Plus. So I, when I joined MBSC, I would say I was, was very familiar with the balancing process. And you've set out a summary of the daily and weekly balancing procedures which existed in the early years of Horizon and you say still applied in 2004 in your witness statement to the inquiry. For the record, the relevant paragraphs are paragraphs 25 to 37 of WITN 0909010. Could we have Mr. S Mr. Wise's statement on screen, please? That is the reference I've just given at page nine of that document, please. At paragraph 27, please. And this paragraph uh, describes in broad terms the daily reports which needed to be completed um, as follows. Branches had a set of procedures they had to complete daily, which involved the account and dispatch of various documentation. This included reports such as the daily checklisting, gyro bank deposits and withdrawals, national savings deposits and withdrawals, TV licenses, personal banking, and automated payment transactions. For each of these products, the branch would produce a daily report, check the counterfoils, which they have kept in the counter till, agrees with the number and value on the report and then dispatch in the relevant envelope. The actual procedure on Horizon would be to go into the counter daily report screen, select the report they wish to look at and then select print. Once the branch was satisfied that they had a counterfoil for each transaction, they would select the cutoff option on the Horizon screen. Cutting off the report just meant that it would reset to zero for the next day. Going over the page, please, down to paragraph 30. You then deal with the daily cash declaration here. So another daily procedure was the daily cash declaration. Each branch was required to complete an accurate daily cash declaration each day on the Horizon system as close to closing as possible. This was a mandatory process and enabled the post office cash management teams to track how much cash was in the network and request excess cash back. You then deal with the weekly reports which needed to be completed at paragraph 31. And then starting at paragraph 32, over the page please, you deal with the actual balance process. Have I understood correctly that this balance process involved a number of steps, which were these, and please correct me if I'm wrong at any stage. Once the daily and weekly reports were printed and reconciled, the next step was a check of the physical stock on hand and whether this agreed with the figures on horizon. And just pausing there, you deal at paragraph 32 of your statement with what a sub-postmaster or branch staff member could do, if that was not the case, don't you? Yes. And about halfway down there, you say, any differences found in either of these ways should be corrected by either adjusting their stock in the adjust stock screen or making a sale or completing a reversal against the stock item. Making the sale, the sale would reduce the system held stock figure. This is where the branch physically has less stock than Horizon shows. And completing a reversal would increase the system held stock figure. This is where the branch physically has more stock than Horizon that, that Horizon shows. The last way a branch could check their stock against Horizon would be to make a stock declaration. The branch would type in the value of every stock item they have and a Horizon overwrites the existing stock figures with the newly declared stock figures. Then you say this, the declare, declare stock option was rarely recommended for branches to do as it could often cause confusion and leave the branch struggling to balance. Could you please expand on why the declare stock option could cause confusion? 
Okay, so Horizon kept a track of all your stock items, and, and in a particular post office branch, th they would have dozens and dozens from different types of envelopes, overseas items, philatelic items, first, second class stamp, stamp books. So they had, you know, a lot of, of different stock items. The system would show, would track that. So every time a stock item was sold, it would reduce the number of that item and you give that stamp. So if you sell a first class stamp, Horizon reduces by one and you give a first class stamp to the customer. So when you check your stock at the end of the, the week, what you physically have should agree with what Horizon says. And you can check that quite easily by doing a balance snapshot or going into the adjust stock screen. The function for declare stock was for you to tell Horizon what stock items you had. And so it, it wiped clear everything it thought you had by tracking it and was just overwriting those figures with what you told it. So if, if I forget about a batch of stamp books in my cupboard and I don't declare them, it wipes them completely off the system, which any stock item like that that you delete off the system, it would give you a cash discrepancy ultimately. So if it were £100 worth of stamp books, he would get a cash discrepancy to say he's a hundred pounds short and he may not understand where that discrepancy has come from. Uh, an, another thing that was quite common with the declare stock, a postmaster would go into it and think, oh, I don't want to be in here. So he'd confirm it and come out and that would set everything to zero. So it's as though he's told the horizon system that every single stock item is zero. So if he's got £10,000 worth of stock, that would then translate into a £10,000 loss. Now, it, it's rectifiable and can be resolved, but it's, it's quite a complicated process. And postmasters get very good at doing what they do every single day, every single week, when they have to do something on Horizon that's new and they've never done before, then that's when they can experience quite serious problems that will get them into a mess. Like I said, nothing like that is unresolvable. We could always correct it, but it's quite difficult, especially over the telephone at MBSC, to talk through a process to get back to a position where the postmaster's balancing. So that, that's, so as, as a HFSO, as a trainer, as an MBSC advisor, I would never recommend a branch to declare the stock. It's it's one of the pitfalls, as I call it, in the system. You know, it, it's the way the system's designed, but it can get that postmaster into a little bit of a mess. And how would sub-postmasters or branch staff know that the declare stock option could cause confusion and leave the branch struggling to balance? Were they trained on that? You referenced you as a trainer. Uh, myself as a trainer, um, I would make it clear in the classroom not to do that. And equally, as an HFSO, I would make it clear not to do that. It, it, it's so much simpler doing it one of the other two ways rather than declaring stock. Now, the design was around if you've got two stock units and they what are called shared stock units and two people with their own supply of stock each of those two clerks could make a stock declaration for their little bit of stock and the system adds that together and in theory it all balances. But in practice it just wasn't that simple. So it was easier to count my stock and your stock and add the numbers together and then do a balance snapshot and check the numbers agree. And was this a common problem, a mismatch between the count for physical stock on hand and the figure generated by the Horizon system from your experience when you were an advisor on Tier 2? I wouldn't say common. I would say it happened a notable time, but I wouldn't say common. You go on to set out the next step after the physical stock check, which was a stamp declaration, then the foreign currency on hand figure, and finally the cash declaration, uh, which you say involved entering the value of each denomination of note and coin. And you deal with this at paragraph 35 of your statement, 
This is page 12, please. And in the last sentence on this page, you say this, it was important that the balanced cash declaration was the last thing to be done, as making changes in any of the steps before this could alter the system-derived cash figure, and a new declaration would have to be made. You deal with the final stages of the balancing process at paragraph 36 over the page, please. And you say this, once the cash declaration is made, the branch would make a variance check which would show any discrepancies. This is for shared stock units only. Individual stock units would get a message after declaring the cash, informing them of any discrepancies. The branch would then proceed to printing the trial balance report. It is at this point that the horizon system commits any discrepancies and the loss or gain would show at the top of the trial balance report. The branch would then roll the stock unit over into the next cash account period and a final balance report would be produced. That can come down now, thank you. In 2004, if there was a discrepancy showing at the top of the trial balance report, which a sub-postmaster or branch staff member wanted to question, what options were available to them? The first thing I would suggest they would do was recount the cash in stock before they, they took any options to contacting anybody. Um, often cash was miscounted or stock hasn't been checked correctly. So I would have expected a postmaster to, to revert to that first of all. Um, but their option would be to contact the MBSC. Um, MBSC was set up as a single point of contact for branches before Horizon and before MBSC. The helplines were regional. Um, the business brought that together as, as one centre at Dern House in, in Barnsley. Um, and that, that was the main contact point for branches. So when any queries really like that, they would ring through to MBSC. Could the branch carry on trading in the next cash account period if they did not roll over the stock unit and commit the trial balance to a final balance report? No. Well, yes, they would be trained, trading in the same cash account period and that, that couldn't go on for very long because there was a team, and I'm not sure which team it fell under, but one of the teams as part of MBSC um, would contact branches that hadn't rolled over um, because I believe if, if a branch hadn't rolled over within, I don't know if it was 60 days or 90 days, then that data potentially could be lost. So there was a team specifically to contact branches that hadn't rolled over and to get them to roll over. So if a branch chose to carry on serving in the same cash account period, they would get that contact from somebody at MBSC. Moving on to your time at the Network Business Support Centre, um, there were a number of teams within the MBSC, weren't there? Yes. Um, and you set those out in your statement, but your role was as a Tier 2 Service Support Advisor within one of the service support teams? Yes. Can you explain the difference um, between the roles of Tier 1 and Tier 2 advisors, please? The Tier 1 advisor was pretty much a call centre call handler. They, they would deal with the simple issues. Um, we had branches phoning up just for telephone numbers or asking if they could send certain mail items to certain countries. Uh, a Tier 1 advisor had access to all that information via the knowledge base and the remedy system, and they could answer those queries relatively quickly. If the Tier 1 advisor couldn't find the answer on the knowledge base, um, then generally that would be passed over to Tier 2, and the Tier 2 advisor had more experience, they received more training. A lot of the advisors had come from other areas of the business, such as the old helpline, such as directly managed branches, um, so they knew more than what the Tier 1 advisor knew. So they could spend more time looking at the problem and finding a resolution for the postmaster. And you've mentioned the knowledge base. 
Um, can you just explain what was covered, broadly speaking, in the knowledge base? What's, what type of issues? Every single type of issue you could think of, really. Um, they, there would be a knowledge base article covering off the answer to that query. Um, there was a system in place where on tier two, we had the option to close a call down to own knowledge. So we knew that this was the correct course of action to take. So there's no knowledge base article that covers that, but we've obtained the answer. It could be by speaking to a member of the product team. It could be speaking to colleagues. So if a case was closed down to own knowledge and wasn't linked to a knowledge base title, the knowledge base team would look at that and look at implementing a page on the knowledge base to cover off that question. So every time a new question came up that hadn't been asked before that wasn't on the knowledge base, it would then be put onto the knowledge base for the other advisors and future calls. You have explained at paragraph 10 of your statement that the type of queries which the NBSC would deal with ranged vastly from simple questions such as requesting a telephone number for a particular person to more complicated questions, including questions around how to balance. Were balancing problems generally referred to Tier 2 support service advisors like yourself? Not generally. Tier 1 had a process on the knowledge base that gave the basic check this, have they declared the cash, have they checked the stock? So it would probably the basic check steps for them to go through and sometimes tier one might resolve that balancing query so it wasn't passed through to tier two. If they couldn't resolve it, then generally they would always be passed through to tier two. You say at paragraph 19 of your statement to the inquiry that on average tier two advisors would deal with around four or five calls in an hour whereas the number of calls for tier one advisors would be much higher as their calls were a lot quicker. So is it fair to say tier one advisors didn't have very much time to deal with the queries that were coming in? That's right. And, and their uh, tier one and tier two was managed by different companies. So we were all under Raw Mail Group and part of Raw Mail Group, there was a company called, I think it was Customer Management, and they managed all Raw Mail's contact centres, so tier one were employed by customer management, whereas tier two were employed directly by Post Office Limited, still under the umbrella of Raw Mail Group. And at tier one, they had quite stringent targets to achieve on the, the calls per hour, and the amount of time after a call ends for them to wrap up that call, so it could be typing up the, the response in the case and closing it down on the system. So their targets were, were quite strict compared to what tier two targets were. But, but tier two equally had targets and it were averaged out based on how much time you spent in admin and that's the time you would spend investigating or finding an answer for a, a query, how much time in wrap up, that's the call, the time immediately after a call's ended where you're updating the, the log and putting a resolution in and closing the case down. And, and even the amount of time you go for comfort breaks to the toilet, you know, it were all measured through the phone system. So each month you would sit down with your line manager and you'd say, well, you know, you've been in comfort break for five hours this week. What have you been doing? You know, and it could be you'd forgot to press the button on the phone system or, you know, so, so it was monitored and we did have our targets, but this certainly wasn't anywhere near as strict as what tier one was. And did those limits mean you felt somewhat under pressure to deal with queries quite quickly? Yes and no. At the point of dealing with that call, you was focused on finding a resolution and you, were, you wasn't focused on um, you know, worrying about how much time you were spending on it. You might have a word with your team leader and just say, look, I'm going to have to spend some time with this. On saying that, when you got your monthly figures and you're told your admin time is such a percentage above the average for tier two advisors, then that certainly put pressure on you thinking, oh, well, you know, so, so you might find ways to 
move it into wrap up a little bit more to you know play the figures perhaps to so to bring your admin time down but you'd push it's robin peter to pay paul you'd push that into wrap up time just so at the end of the month when you have your one to one you're not getting in trouble for for being too much or they measured it on the average time across the tier two so you know if you were above that then they, they would ask you questions on why in contrast to the business net, uh, the network business support center which was staffed by post office employees the horizon system helpline was staffed by employees from icl pathways at, as it was at the time is yes. that right yes and the horizon system helpline teams were in a separate location that's right the horizon system helpline was the technical support team for post office branches to contact with issues relating to the Horizon computer system, is that right? Yes. And it was the Horizon system helpline which dealt with technical issues such as equipment faults or faults relating to the Horizon system. That's what you'd say in your statement. Yes. You say in your statement to the inquiry at paragraph 23 that the network business support centre would interact with the Horizon System helpline and often callers would transfer through from one service to the other. And from a business, a network business support centre point of view, if a caller claimed that they were experiencing issues with their Horizon System, you would transfer them to the Horizon System helpline. That's what you say in your statement at paragraph yes. 23. And you deal with this, um, may we please have the statement back up on the screen. It's WITN 09001000, page seven, please. Could we have paragraph 23, please, towards the bottom? And right at the bottom, uh, you say, I do recall that, it goes over the page, Sometime call, sometimes callers would get passed backwards and forwards between NBSC and HSH, particularly where a branch had losses and queried whether there was an issue with the Horizon system. I do recall that it was often difficult to get HSH to take ownership of calls, where branches were experiencing losses as their main criteria for investigating a system issue for a branch was whether they had a receipts and payments mismatch when the branch balanced. From memory, I do not recall any branches I dealt with having a receipt and payments mismatch. In situations where callers were passed back and forth, the MBSC advisor would speak to their team leader, who may in turn speak to their counterpart at HSH to try and get an agreement on who should have ownership of the call. That can come down now, thank you. Can you explain what you understood at the time by a receipts and payments mismatch? The Horizon system is based on a double entry bookkeeping um, account system. So in, in the days of manual, manual balancing, you had a great big ledger document, a daily one and a, a weekly one. And you had your receipt transactions, which generally speaking were transactions where money were coming in and payment transactions where money was going out. So the way Horizon was designed was the double entry bookkeeping, everything would have a, a counter entry. So if, if money was coming in, then on the other side, cash would go up. And likewise, if money was going out on the other side, cash would go down. So the receipts and payments when the trial balance is produced had to agree because every transaction has its counterpart. If the receipts and payments mismatched and they didn't agree, that was an indication that something has happened in the accounts that perhaps shouldn't have happened. Um, we probably didn't think of it as a bug as such, but for want of a better word, we we'll, can call it a bug. But it just indicated that there was an issue, something had gone in the accounts to cause that mismatch. And what would happen from that, the branch wouldn't be able to roll over and proceed to cash account and they would have to go to Fujitsu to get them to remedy whatever the issue was um, so and if they didn't ring MBSC then the process I described earlier about a team ringing branches serving in the same cash account period they would ring the branch to find out why they'd not 
rolled over so it really wouldn't get missed. They would either, the branch would ring MBSC at the time when they experienced the mismatch or somebody would contact the branch if they'd not done that because they'd be serving in the same cash account period. Um, but that, that was the main indicator that something had happened on the system because there were never a scenario where the re receipts and payments would not agree. And how did you come to understand that the Horizon System Helpline would use this as their main criteria of accepting ownership of a call? I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if it stems from my days working on the Horizon project or that was what we was told uh, as part of the training package for MBSC. I, I can't recall which it was, but that, that was my understanding and my memory was that that was a general understanding across advisors. In terms of the information you as a tier two advisor within the Network Business Support Centre had access to, um, you had access to the knowledge base, we've touched on that. You also had access, you say in your statement, to all counter operations manuals and Horizon user and balancing guides. Yeah. But you say you did not have access to any branch Horizon transactional information, is that right? That's correct, yes. So you were reliant on what someone calling you told you over the phone? Yes. Save that you sometimes ask branches to fax or post paperwork through to you? Yes. Speaking in general terms, is it right that your evidence to the inquiry is that when the Network Business Support Centre looked at branch cash accounts to assist a postmaster, you were looking to see if any mistakes became apparent? That's the wording you've used in your statement. Yeah, that's correct. And you say at paragraph 47 of your statement to the inquiry, we need not turn that up now, um, that the Network Business Support Centre would not have been able to identify if there were any issues caused by the Horizon system, this would have to be investigated by the Horizon System Helpline. That's correct. And you say in your statement to the inquiry at paragraph 56, again, we need not turn it up for now, while you were at the Network Business Support Centre, you dealt with numerous branches who had balancing issues or discrepancies? That's correct. Turning then, please, to your involvement in dealing with the calls made by Mr. Castleton to the Network Business Support Centre between December 2003 and April 2004. In the statement you provided for the purposes of the litigation brought by the Post Office against Mr. Castleton, um, a statement dated the 13th of October 2006. You provided an overview, didn't you, of all the call logs from the Marine Drive branch in this five-month period? Yes. Could we have that statement on screen, please? The reference is LCAS 00001100. And it's page nine of that document, please. Paragraph 35. Do you say here, as appears from the above call logs below, there were a total of 88 MBSC call logs relating to the Marine Drive branch for the period December 2003 to April 2004. Out of these 88 calls, 62 calls appear to be concerned with minor issues. Of the remainder, for the period from December 2003 to 23rd of March 2004, 11 calls, and I won't go on to specify all those dates, appear to relate purely to the issue of losses. 11 further calls appear to relate purely to computer issues of various sorts and four further calls appear to raise issues relating to both the losses and computer system. None of the call logs themselves revealed the existence of any computer faults 
although the sub-postmaster did in some calls say that he thought he was having, that he was having computer problems. One of the calls which you categorised as relating purely to the issue of losses was dealt with by you, wasn't it? The call on the 22nd of January 2004? I believe I dealt with one of the calls. I can't recall the, the date. I think I referenced it in my statement. You deal with this in paragraph 55 of your statement to the inquiry. Uh, we needn't turn that up now. Um, but could we have on screen, please, the table setting out details of the 88 calls made in the relevant period? This was part of the documentation produced for the trial in the case against Mr. Castleton and the references LCAS 0000365. And it's page 29 of that document, please. Uh, the entry on this page relates to the call it appears you dealt with on the 22nd of January 2004. In the column in the middle, the incident log column, we can see the call being alloc allocated to wise A underscore. Is that you? Yes. And we can see the date in the first column um, and a brief description which says discrepancy in the third column. And in the activity column, four from the right, we see it says cash account discrepancy. There's a more detailed description in the fourth column there. PM has a loss of hashtag 4,000. He was in the office until 11 o'clock last night and could not find anything. And then there's the resolution in the fifth column. Um, is this the entry made by you? Um, I can't see the resolution on the screen. It, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth column in. Oh, yes. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, the, 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 what, what normally happened, tier one would put, quite basic information in. So I may well have changed the detailed description to be a little bit more descriptive, and the resolution would have been written by myself who closed the call down. And the resolution reads, went through all the balance checks with PM. He had checked the REMS in and out, his, his cash stock and P&A, and he was unable to find the loss. Advised I would pass through to suspense. Looking at these notes of the actions you took, what information do you think you had to work with when you were going through this with Mr. Castleton? From that call, I believe it would all be verbal over the telephone. So it would be me drawing out information, asking him to check various reports, um, going into various declarations, asking him to check his cash again. So it would be me talking him through everything on, on the telephone. And you referred, you said you were going to pass through to suspense. Did that mean you were going to refer the case to the suspense team? Yeah, so what would normally happen, I, I would close this call down because that's my call and my stat, and then I would create a new call that would be allocated to the suspense account team for the, them to look at whether they would authorise the loss um, or not. I'm not sure what their processes were, but the main thing was he had a £4,000 loss that probably couldn't afford to put in. Um, so the suspense account team would look at whether he could hold that loss in his suspense account to give time to see if anything came back from Chesterfield as a transaction correction or, or to see if, if anything else came back that would account for the £4,000 loss. And would the suspense team do any further investigation? I'm not entirely sure. I know they'd linked in with the retail line managers um, because often authorisation would come from the retail line manager um, to decide whether it could be held in suspense. And I think the hardship side of it was driven by the retail line manager. But I'm un unsure of any work the suspense account team would, would undertake. 
Could we have on screen, please, the document at FUJ 0012094? This is a peak incident management system log. Um, who would create these? This would be created at Horizon System Help Desk. Um, I understand you've recently been provided with a copy of this log. Is that right? Did this make it through to you? Yes, it did. And just to be clear, this log does not relate to calls made to the Network Business Support Centre by Mr Castleton, but the reporting of this issue to the Horizon System helpline took place on the 13th of January 2004, shortly before you dealt with the call from Mr Castleton on the 22nd of January 2004. And looking at the second box down, please, the entry at 1523. And this is three lines down <clears throat> in the box. We can see call details have been taken from Andrew Wise at NBSC on telephone number stated above. PM has a discrepancy with his cash account for the last few weeks. And then in the box further down, the MBSC, this is three lines down again under information, the MBSC have been through the checks with the PM and feel there is a software error as the PM has negative figures which he would not have been able to enter. So this is an example, isn't it, of you considering that a cash account discrepancy might be being caused by a problem with the Horizon system software, is that right? I would pitch it more as there was something in the account that didn't look usual. Um, and I, I know on the line at 1525 that it refers to he can only declare the holdings amount of zero, not a negative figure. So that would indicate that it's to do with either a cash stamp or stock declaration that wasn't doing what you would expect it to do. So in that instance, our only course of action would be to pass that over to HSH for them to look at to, to come up with a resolution or a fix or whatever that may be. Had you known of cases prior to this one where a cash account discrepancy had been caused by a problem with the Horizon system? I'm, I'm not aware, I'm not sure if it's a case of I don't remember or if that never occurred. The, the pro problem also with this particular incident here once that were passed over to HSH, I would close my call down and move on to the next. So I, I would never get any feedback to say whether it's a, a technical issue or not. We, we pass it over and they look at it. And I guess this is kind of showing the system working. We pass it to HSH because we spot something that doesn't seem normal. And we can justify the reason for passing it to them. So. On, on the previous call we looked at where it was just a £4,000 loss, that's all we've got. We've done our checks and in those circumstances it was pretty much next to impossible to get Fujitsu to take that on because there's no indication of anything going wrong. Whereas in this instance, the reference to the negative figures at declaration um, it is that foot in the door to be able to get HSH to take that on, which they have done and, and investigated that. In the situation with Mr Castleton, where you also weren't being presented with information of a user error, did you consider whether the problem might have been caused by the Horizon system? I don't think I did. I, I don't think that was a consideration um, that come in, we were we were focused on solving the problem, and th the assumption was that it was a, mis a mistake. So we're looking for where that mistake has been made. Were you told about the outcome of this issue, not Mr. Castleton, but the one we have on screen at the moment, at the time? No.
Going back to your involvement in the issues being raised by Mr Castleton in early 2004, do you have any independent recollection now of assisting Ms Pennington with analysis of the problems being experienced by Mr Castleton in late January and February 2004? I, I don't have any recollection of the specific interaction, no, I don't. You addressed this involvement in your statement for the litigation brought against Mr Castleton by the Post Office. That's the statement dated the 13th of October 2006. Could we have this on screen, please? That's LCAS 00001110. At page seven, please. And paragraph 26 here reads as follows. Sarah Pennington, who has since left the post office, was the tier two advisor who dealt with some of the calls raised by this office at around the end of January 2004. At that time and during these calls, she discussed the issues with me. I do not now remember all of the details of this case, but have refreshed my memory from reviewing the MBSC call logs and the email dated the 20th of April 2004 from Andrew Price, NBSC, to Catherine Oglesby, who was then Mr Castleton's retail line manager, brackets page 13. Did you have an independent recollection of the analysis you did and the conclusions you reached when you provided this statement in October 2006? I, honestly, I don't know because the memory becomes, do I remember the events of the trial and knowing I read the email which refreshed my memory or so, so it, kind of gets a bit muddled up to what I'm actually remembering. I'm remembering what happened in 2006 based on what we presented, or I'm remembering actually the interaction in 2004. Um, so I, I'm not sure about the time I remembered it. It was only two years after the interaction with Sarah Pennington, um, and my memory is generally quite good, so it could be at that time I had a vague recollection of that, but. The, the sheer numbers of calls we, we dealt with and also being one of the more experienced advisors with balancing, quite a lot of colleagues would come and ask me questions and ask me to review things because they couldn't find an answer and they knew my experience was greater. So as well as my own calls that I was dealing with, I was getting asked a lot of questions as well. So. I, c I couldn't say for sure if I remembered in 2006 what had happened in 2004 or not, unfortunately. In terms of the provenance of the email you refreshed your memory from, could we go over the page, please, to paragraph 33 of the statement? And towards the bottom of the page there. You say here, I can see from the MBSC call logs that on the 4th of March 2004, Mrs Oglesby asked MBSC for information of calls made to the MBSC from the Marine, branch, Marine Drive branch relating to losses when balancing and what investigations were undertaken by MBSC during those calls. I helped Sarah Pennington to prepare an email that Andrew Price, MBSC, could and did forward to Mrs Oglesby on the 20th of April 2004 to explain what investigations had by that time already been carried out. <coughs> Can we look please to that email of the 20th of April 2004, which appears on the last page of this document, page 30 please. And Andrew Price, whose name appears um, in bold as the sender and at the bottom of this email. Um, says at the start of the email that he asked Ms Pennington and you to provide a form of words and actions taken whilst dealing with the PM at the above, above branch. Um, so is it, does it follow that after the punctuation there, and it's, it's quite a bad copy, but it looks like we have a dash um, and a colon, is that the wording prepared by you and Mrs. Pennington? Ms. Pennington? 
I, I believe so. It certainly reads like that. And that wording reads as follows. When I spoke to the PM at Marine Drive, he was unsure what was causing these errors. He told me that he has been using the slave machine for his REMS, and I assured him that wouldn't cause a problem as long as he was attached to the correct stock unit. The PM thought there would be some errors relating to national lottery. I phoned the lottery team at Transaction Processing who confirmed that there were some errors relating to lottery, but for every charge error, there was a corresponding claim error. This was due to the lottery figures being, being entered on Horizon in the wrong CAP. PM was also concerned that when entering the lottery figures, it was as though the terminals were not communicating. But if that was the case, the PM would have large number of errors on every report and product. The PM sent cash account information to NBSC and it was looked at by Andrew Wise. He was unable to find any errors. The only amount questioned was a large amount on the checks to processing centre, which Andrew was able to confirm was a check payment for the purchase of premium bonds. The PM was advised there was nothing more we could do and we suggested he works on a manual system at the side of Horizon to see if any problems were highlighted. Also, when doing the REMS, the PM should take a snapshot before and after to see if any problems were occurring when doing a remittance. The line underneath this says, Andrew Wise and I both feel that the Horizon system is working properly and we are unable to help the PM any further. Just to clarify, was this Andrew Price saying that you and he felt that the Horizon system was working properly? I believe so, yes. And going back to what you said in your statement for the litigation about this email, this is page eight of the document we're currently looking at, paragraph 32, about two thirds of the way down. Although I do not now recall it, our email suggests, and I believe, that we concluded that the Horizon system was working properly and did not appear to be the cause of the unauthorised losses incurred. Before going into any more detail about the substance of your conclusions there, I'd like to ask you please a little bit about the process by which this statement for the litigation was prepared, if I may. You deal with the circumstances in which you came to provide a statement for the litigation at paragraph 50 of your statement to the inquiry. There's no need to have that up on screen at the moment. You were approached by Bond Pierce, who were acting for the post office in the litigation, is that right? Yes. Could we have up on screen, please, the document at POL 0007822? And if we could scroll down, please. The email dated the 21st of April, 2006. This appears to be the first contact made with you by Bond Pierce. Is that right? Yes. Um, and this email is from Stephen Dilly, a solicitor with Bond Pierce. Yes. And we see at point one, um, a summary of the dispute. Over the page, please. At point two. A, number, a summary of the, the assertions being made about the computer system by Mr. Castleton. And at point three, further down the page, about halfway through that paragraph, Mr. Dilly says, I would like to arrange to meet and interview you at Capstan House in June to understand what involvement you had at the time and what, to make, what you make of Mr. Castleton's assertions. Based on our discussions, I will then prepare a short statement, witness statement for you to approve and sign. After you met with Bond Pierce, is it right that a first draft of the statement was provided to you? Yes, I believe so. And there were some further amendments made following correspondence between you and Bond Pierce? Yes. Was it explained to you at the time you were making the statement the importance of ensuring that everything in the statement was accurate to the best of your knowledge and your belief? 
to be honest, I'm, I'm unsure. Um, at that point, I'd never given evidence in court before. I'd never provided a statement before. So I really was in their hands. Um, I, I don't recall what advice they give me. I do remember they come up to where I worked in the building at Capstan House in Salford Keys, and I, I, I think there was two people that come, one being Stephen and somebody else, but I can't fully remember. And, and I do remember that we sat down together and, and they asked me questions. And I think from my knowledge of processes, that's why the statement grew beyond just being about Mr. Castleton's case and growing into processes on balancing things like that. I think it became apparent to them that I had quite a good knowledge of the processes. Um, I, I don't recall that, because I know, I know from the jobs I've done su subsequently, the importance of statements, I've attended court. Um, I don't recall any advice as such around that, but I don't know if it's just I don't remember or a case they didn't, I can't, I can't answer that, I'm sorry. And you gave evidence at the trial in the Castleton case on the 11th of December 2006, is that right? Yes. And you confirmed the contents of your written statement for the litigation in oral evidence. Could we have on screen, please, your statement for the litigation at LCAS 0000110? It's page 21 of that document, please. And this is your concluding paragraph at paragraph 115. I think the numbering is somewhat out there because we go from 122 to 115. Um, but at the bottom of the page, you say this. Having reviewed the email dated the 20th of April 2004, I can see that we did not find anything to suggest that the Horizon system was not working properly or causing the unauthorised losses. The MBSC call logs do not themselves reveal the existence of any computer faults. Can we compare this, please, with what you said earlier in your statement at paragraph 32, this is page eight of the document, please. You say here, although I do not now recall it, our email suggests and I believe that we concluded that the Horizon system was working properly and did not appear to be the cause of the unauthorised losses incurred. Uh, I go back that, to that not to be rep repetitious, but you do, don't you, go one step further in paragraph 32 than your concluding paragraph. So you're saying here that you believe you concluded that the Horizon system was working properly and did not appear to be the cause of the unauthorised losses incurred, as opposed to saying, in effect, there was no evidence of a problem. Um, there being no evidence of a problem would logically lead me to the conclusion, you know, that I concluded it was working properly. So I believe one thing would lead to the next. It might be worded different. I think the point of it trying to make is, is the same point that I didn't consider there were an issue with the Ryzen system. Um, worded slightly differently, but I think one would lead to the next, if that makes sense. Can we go, please, to your statement to the inquiry um, at WITN 090-90100? This is page 16, please. Paragraph 47, about two-thirds of the way down the page. And you say here, in the email from Andrew Price dated the 20th of April 2004, he writes that Andrew Wise and myself both feel that the Horizon system is working properly and we are unable to help the PM further. In my witness statement from 2006, I comment that I did not recall saying that and I still do not recall a conversation with Andrew Price where this was discussed. Generally, when MBSC looked at branch cash accounts to assist a, po a postmaster, we were looking to see if any mistakes become apparent. 
MBSC would not have been able to identify if there were any issues caused by the Horizon system. This would have to be investigated by HSH. The only indication for MBSC to establish whether there was an issue with the Horizon system would be a receipts and payments mismatch when the branch tries to balance. From reviewing the documentation provided, I cannot see any evidence of a receipts and payments mismatch occurring at Marine Drive Post Office. My assumption now would be the lack of a receipt and payment mismatch would be the basis of the comment in Andrew Price's email. It's quite an important point, isn't it, that the Network Business Support Centre would not have been able to identify if there were any issues caused by the Horizon system and that this would have to be investigated by the Horizon system helpline. Yes, it is important. Because if that's right, it would be difficult for the NBSC, as opposed to the Horizon System helpline, to conclude that the Horizon System was working properly. It, it would be, but NBSC would never have sight of the full machine, if you like. We were a small cog and... You know, there were suspense account teams, there were Horizon, there were the area managers, there were other teams that, that would look at it. We're just a small cog. So within scope of what MBSC could do, I'm answering that within that scope of what we look at, we can't identify any, any losses. So I'm not giving a blanket statement for the whole business, for the whole HSH. I'm saying within the scope of what I can look at, I cannot see anything that would indicate an horizon loss that, like you said, that would have to go to Fujitsu ultimately to determine that. This, this caveat, if I can call it that, as to what NBSC could and couldn't do, doesn't seem to appear, at least not in these terms, in your statement for the litigation. Can you remember ever suggesting that it, it, it was included? I can't remember suggesting that. Can you see that without this caveat, the reader of paragraph 32 of your statement for the litigation might have thought that the Network Business Support Centre was in a position to draw the conclusion on its own that there were no issues caused by the Horizon system? Yes, I can see how that could be perceived. Ms Price, would you take the witness back to that paragraph and the misnumbered 115 again, just for me to be precise, precise in my mind about what they say. Of course. Starting with 115, sir. Yeah. That's LCAS 0000110, page 21. Towards the bottom, 115. This is the concluding paragraph, which is in slightly different terms to the paragraph we went yeah. to earlier. But on the face of it, um, Mr. Wise, uh, and if I'm taking it out of context, please say so, that does appear to me to, hopefully reading it objectively, to be an assertion that there was that the Horizon system had not caused any unauthorised losses, which is a very broad statement, is it not? It, it is quite a broad statement. That, that was my view based on what we could do at, at MBSC. And, and but as Mr Price has pointed out to you, in your evidence to me, you're making it clear that what you could do at NBSC was much less um, than that statement might lead a reasonable reader to conclude. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, yes. Thank you. Do you have any recollection of actually drafting those words yourself? I don't recall drafting the words. I know the statement was written on my behalf and sent to me to read through, and I think there were several drafts of it which I read through 
Um, the things I tended to look at changing were likely things like processes that were not quite correct that had been put in there. So having spoken to the two people that came up to Capstan House to see me, they went away and wrote the statement based on that conversation, which I think there were two, two or three emails to and fro asking questions on me, me reading through and changing things that I felt necessary to change. Um, I, I don't think I wrote these words. Um, and, and looking back at kn knowing what I know now, looking back at a statement from 2006 that was written on my behalf, it, it does make me cringe a little bit, for want of a better word, and I would look at that and think, well, ooh, I wouldn't have necessarily pitched it like that, but that's with the knowledge I've gained over the years and the jobs I've done more recently to be able to look at it and think that. I follow, thank you. Sorry for interrupting, Ms. Price. Not at all, sir. Coming back to the level of calls being made by Mr. Castleton between December 2003 and April 2004, this was a man, wasn't it, who was desperately seeking help to understand why he was experiencing discrepancies? Yes. If we can turn, please, to page 21 of your statement to the inquiry. So this is WITN 090 901000. Uh, page 21, please. Uh, at paragraph 58, a little further down the page, please. You reviewed some of the Horizon System helpline call logs provided to you by the inquiry and you draw this conclusion in your last sentence. Although I am not familiar with the layout of these HSH logs, and I'm not familiar with some of the technical terms and jargon, it is clear that Mr. Castleton made numerous attempts to request HSH look at his Horizon system as he was experiencing large and frequent losses. Then this at paragraph 59, As I mentioned earlier in this statement, broadly speaking, the service support team in MBSC was responsible for dealing with transaction and process related queries. This included the balancing process and supporting with losses. HSH was responsible for dealing with technical related issues. My memory of my time at NBSC was that it was always difficult to get HSH to investigate balancing type issues as they deemed these MBSC responsibility. And unless there was a receipts and payments mismatch, they deemed it an NBSC issue. Could we go please to page 23 of this document and paragraph 63? And you say this, having familiarized myself with the documents provided to, to me by the inquiry, importantly, the MBSC call logs and Fujitsu call logs, I can see that Mr. Castleton, or a member of his staff, repeatedly reached out to both helplines, requesting support regarding his balancing and the losses he was experiencing. This was probably on a more frequent level than you would expect from branches, although this would not have been known at the time of taking the call, as the service support advisor would not have full visibility of all the information. You then conclude at paragraph 64 at the bottom of the page. However, this is three lines from the bottom, after reviewing the call logs, I do think that Mr. Castleton was left out on a limb and numerous calls were concluded by sending him to another team. This meant that Mr. Castleton was bounced between MBSC and HSH, which looking back at that now, I do not think that was helpful for Mr. Castleton. These are obviously your reflections on matters now. You say at paragraph 65 that you did not really form any conclusions of causes of losses when assisting branches, so at the time. But at the time you were involved in the litigation as a witness, did you ever question the basis on which the post office was pursuing Mr. Castleton for the apparent losses in question? 
in circumstances when Mr Castleton himself had repeatedly sought help from the helplines to get to the bottom of the cause. I think during the litigation in 2006, I was just focused on the evidence I was given. I wasn't really exposed to a lot of things that I've been exposed to since. I understood from my experience that the post office would go after all losses. Um, you know, postmasters were responsible, and the, that that was the line. You're responsible for the losses, and they pursued that. I understood that. I didn't really give thought. I didn't. I didn't have the full picture to to think uh, this poor man. He's reached out all these times, and and now we're going after him for the money. I, I was there focusing on my little piece of evidence because it was quite new to me. It was quite daunting, so I didn't think I had the capacity, if that makes sense, to broaden that. It was quite a stressful time to go down to London, to go to court, to, to do all the work with the solicitors. So I think that was my focus rather than thinking broader than that. Did you ever ask yourself whether there was an actual loss to be recovered? No, I don't think I did. Reflecting on things now, do you think it was right that the post office pursued Mr Castleton for the apparent losses in the litigation in the way it did? It's a difficult one to answer that. My thinking lately, with everything that's going on, has been around that this put the post office has had this contract we say for 300 years you know that's as long as post office has existed it was a very archaic contract and very harsh on postmasters and what i tend to think about is at what point that should have changed should that have been in the 90s should that have been in 2006 should that have been in 90, um, 2019 when things did change because of the group litigation so I tend to reflect more on that to try and rationalise in my own head at what point it was appropriate to stop being like that. And I don't know if that was in 2006 when they were pursuing Mr Castleton for this. Certainly thinking back now, it feels very harsh. Um, you know, and, and like you said, he, he, he was crying out for help. He were making calls in there. And regardless of the reason for the loss, my view looking back is post office should and could have interve intervened sooner rather than later and let it get to where it's at so so there's there's a lot of thoughts around it and i wouldn't say i've had a thought thinking oh they shouldn't have gone off after mr castleton for the money because i don't think i have it's more a broader thought around how post office limited operated how it treated postmasters and one of my roles was the business development manager role, which was a sales support role. And I dealt face to face with branches and I had branches who were on the sharp end of post office. You know, it might be they cashed a fraudulent green gyro check and post office saying, right, you've cashed that, you owe us 300 pounds. So my thoughts are post office is very harsh and was very harsh, but I try to reflect more on when as a business that should have changed sit similar to smoking 30 years ago you could sit in a pub and come back smelling a smoke now that's inappropriate was that the right time to stop that or should it have been stopped earlier and that that's how i view it at what point should post office have looked at its contract with some postmasters and said no this isn't acceptable this day and age we need to change that so those are all the questions on i um, i have on the um, Mr. Castleton case. There are some other questions that I have on different issues. Would that be a convenient well, moment to break for lunch? It would, but let me just ask a question that's been going around in my mind because it relates to the Castleton case and then we'll break, all right? Of course, Ms. sir. Price. Apologies. Um, no, 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 that's fine. M Mr. Wise, will you assume for the moment, because there may be a debate about it, 
But will you assume for the moment that some of the evidence which you gave in writing in your witness statement for the litigation and some of the oral answers you may have given when you gave evidence before the judge was what lawyers call opinion evidence, all right? Were you ever to given any advice by any lawyer acting for the post office about the duties involved or the duties imposed upon persons who give opinion evidence as opposed to factual evidence? I don't think I was, no. All right, thank you. Let's have our break. When shall we start again, uh, Ms Price? Um, we are five to one now, so shall we say two o'clock, sir? Certainly, that's fine. Two o'clock, everyone.